Hello, everyone, and welcome to our next EDW session called, oh, I'm sorry, um, Towards a New Age of Conceptual Data Modeling, uh, which will be presented by John Singer, the founder of Node Era Software. All audience members are muted during these sessions, so please submit your questions in the Q&A window on the right side of the screen, and our speaker will respond to as many questions as possible at the end of the talk. Please note that there was a linked form at the bottom of the page titled EDW Conference Session Survey. This is where you can submit session feedback, and we'll encourage you to do so. So let's begin our presentation now. Thank you, and welcome, John. Hi, uh, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here. Even if here is just a virtual conference, it's uh, good that we're having this. So today I want to talk about conceptual data modeling and what I see as the future. So this is very much a, a kind of a, a futuristic uh, talk. and. Uh, so let's get going. First, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a recovering data architect. I've been doing this for over four decades. Uh, recently, I've gotten involved with uh, property graph databases and especially data modeling for property graphs. I've got an open source uh, data modeling software called Nodera. Uh, you're welcome to go to our GitHub page and, and get your free copy. I also have a property graph uh, database fundamentals and modeling course at eLearning Curve. So once again, there's my contact info, and I'd love to hear from you. So today, uh, I want to talk about conceptual modeling, and I'm kind of posing a question, uh, can conceptual models save IT from itself? And I, I definitely think that we need a little bit of saving. Uh, I, we need a little help in terms of how we build systems, especially from a data perspective. So we're gonna look at uh, the current state, kind of what the, the fundamental issue is, uh, as I see it. And uh, then we're going to look at how we might change this in the future. And we'll go through uh, a number of existing technologies that seem to have elements of what, what I believe we need and then talk about uh, how this might all come together. And what we're looking for is really moving from data modeling to meaning modeling, meaning-based modeling that's more language-oriented. And I believe we need to move from uh, databases as they exist today to something that's more of a semantic or conceptual persistence layer. And it, it's, uh, I think it, the way I see this, the systems we build today, despite the fact that they're so much bigger and faster and uh, more of everything, uh, and it's not that our systems don't pr produce good results. People are doing amazing things with machine learning and uh, business analytics. Uh, there's no question about that. But at the end of the day, we're really still building unit record processing systems. Uh, they're just faster and better at what they do. And I don't think we can move forward until we address that issue. So I've been accused of being a physical data modeler. Like maybe that's a, some people see that as an insult. I, I'll accept it. I'm okay with that. Uh, what I mean by that is, and, and maybe those, those of you who are working data modeling groups can, uh, can appreciate this, but uh, you get assigned to a project and as the data modeler and what the project wants is uh, a data model, what they really want is a physical database design. And so the end of the process, that's basically what you, what you get or what you give them is a physical database design. And uh, uh, I've always taken the approach that that's, that's what people want and so that's where we're gonna go. Now the, uh, the modeling approach or the methodology that we've all been taught is we build a conceptual data model, and then we extract from that a logical data model, and then we extract from that or uh, refine that into a physical data model. And I don't have a problem with this process per se, uh, but the problem I have is when you start to ask questions like what is a conceptual data model, you really don't get much of an answer. Uh, you just get kind of broad, brush strokes of, well, it's more abstract. Well, it's just only the entities. And, uh, or it's it's the less refined 
um, model. And it, to me, that's not uh, sufficient. Uh, it's, it's really not what we need to accomplish, but it's all, it's what we have. And so uh, the modeling tools, they do support this. You can create these different models, you can link them together, but the problem you run into is it's really hard to maintain. And, uh, and at the end of the day, uh, honestly, you can create the greatest conceptual model in the world, but nobody cares about it because it's just not impactful to anyone uh, other than the data model. The, the other problem that's happening is uh, with this polyglot persistence layer we now have so many different target databases that an entity relationship model doesn't really apply to a lot of the databases that we're using today. So I like the process. I don't have a complaint with it, but it's really not sufficient for conceptual models. Now that all that being said, I am going to make the statement that I truly believe that we desperately need a conceptual data model. And uh, I think this conference is uh, itself is an example or, or the, the evidence that you need to see why we need a conceptual data model. In my view, most of what this conference deals with are topics that really exist because we need them to fix the lack of a conceptual data design. So all of these processes, the data catalog, glossary, glossary, dictionary, data quality, data governance strategy, data lineage, all of these processes are required because the, the design, to the extent that we even design these things in, in, at the front end of the system, gets lost. It, it isn't captured in the data model uh, because the data model can't capture it. And when we persist the data into the database, it sure doesn't get, get captured there. So uh, I, I believe we need this and I, and I think we need it to fix uh, the issues with the systems we're building. So thinking about this, I've come up with a couple of uh, high level requirements. And this is what I'm describing here is our solution requirements. And it's not just a data model, but uh, I believe it's both the model and the persistence. So I'm calling it a conceptual database. Uh, it's, uh, the, so these, these three requirements are the model has to equal the data. In other words, the model and the data should be defined using the same language. Uh, it should be technology neutral. So uh, the model and the data should of course, as soon as we persist it, we have to commit to some technology to do this thing, but it has to be in a form that we can easily map back and forth to our existing uh, our existing databases. And finally, I think we need to mirror, we need to more closely mirror our human behavior because we're really good at defining concepts and talking about them. And so I think language is to me, really the missing piece. And we'll talk a little more about that as we go on. So what I want to do next is go through quickly uh, some existing technologies that seem to exhibit some of these capabilities. And my general thesis is that a lot of this existing uh, work is going to start merging together. Innovation rarely happens uh, you know, kind of in a vacuum or uh, there's really no such thing as something that's brand new. It's always rethinking or reworking ex existing stuff. All right, so let's go back and we'll talk about some conceptual modeling approaches and we're gonna go back to 1975 and uh, Peter Chen wrote a paper, the entity relationship model toward a unified view of data. His goal at the time was to unify these different data models that were people were talking about and building databases for. Uh, and uh, it, it uh, in the introduction to the paper, he wrote, and I, and I quote here, the relational model is based on relational theory. 
blah, 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 but it may lose some important semantic information about the real world. So there, you know, he hits the nail on the head right at the very beginning that we can create a conceptual model that's more semantically rich, but as soon as we put that data in a relational database, we lose all the context. So his modeling approach, and this is a diagram from a company called Concept Draw. Uh, they have a Chen, they have a diagramming tool that does lots of different diagram types, but they can do a Chen model. And uh, this is just a kind of an eye chart here for you. But a couple of things to notice um, uh, pro or here, relationships can have properties. That's not very terribly relational. Uh, and that you model properties out separately. You represent them and their relationships to their entities separately. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's, I think, a kind of a deeper dive into understanding the data. Uh, but, uh, and I often think, you know, maybe Chen was right. I mean, what if the database vendors had, had built the early databases uh, more along this model, maybe we, maybe we would uh, be a little further along than we are today. So here's another uh, modeling approach that's more conceptually oriented. Uh, it's Niam, which was, it was the guy's name, Nisjin, I'm probably mispronouncing it. That's originally it was that, but then they renamed it the Natural Language Information Analysis Model. And then it kind of became more generally known as the ORM Object Role Model. But this is another modeling approach. This came along, I believe, in the 90s. And uh, their stated goal, it's in the name natural language, they wanted to come up with a, a conceptual modeling approach that more reflected the language that you use to describe the concepts that you're modeling. And uh, one of the things they do here, if you look at the lower uh, right corner there, there's an entity in that circle, it's a, it says value dollar sign plus. And so really that's the an entity that represents all of the positive, possible positive dollar values. And to create a property of an entity, you actually create a, re a relationship that describes that property. So a product has, uh, is nominally charged a dollar value. So it's really that relationship nominally charged that describes the property. And that's once again, is a more uh, semantically rich way to model data. And of course, the problem is this, this one didn't uh, catch on any more than, than Chen's uh, methodology. And that's because you, it doesn't persist in, in this form to a database. You can you could drive a relational design out of this, that's fine, but you lose all that semantic detail. So now I wanna switch gears and look at a couple of database packages uh, relatively new database technologies, I should say, and that seem to give us a little bit of what we're looking for. Uh, the first one's the property graph, uh, uh, probably best realized by a, a company called Neo4j, and they produce a property graph database. And in the property graph, it's a very simple model. It's nodes and relationships. Uh, so the ovals represent nodes and the arrow represents the relationship between two nodes. Uh, and here in this example, you can just see the node has a label called person and then a property called given name with my name. And then the relationship is called home page. And that points to another node that has a label URL and there's my home page. So th this is a more of an ORM style model. And, uh, uh, and that's what's interesting about when you start designing property graphs, you all of a sudden realize that you just kind of intuitively start designing them more like a Chen or an ORM style model. So uh, to understand property graphs, you first, you really need to just let go of everything you know about relational database because it's just not. That's not what it is. So, uh, and I've listed a few of the distinctions here, but uh, uh, the, 
the physical data model for property graphs is fixed. It's very simple. It's nodes and relationships, and you put properties on them. Uh, this is a, an extremely flexible uh, model that you really can kind of do anything you want with it. Uh, the conceptual data model is not defined. You really just define it at runtime. And, uh, and it does kind of, as I said before, you kind of just intuitively start modeling your data more at the uh, treating every property as an entity because you can, because it's simple to do. The downside to this, of course, is that the semantics are just all in your, they're still all in your head. They're, it's just by convention only. And the underlying database doesn't really have any understanding of the semantics. So here's another database technology that's relatively new, and uh, that's the semantic web. So uh, uh, this is the list of standards. It's it's a bunch of W3C or internet standards. And uh, the goal is anyone anywhere can say anything about anything. So it's, it's distributed by its very nature. Uh, you can publish data using this approach and you can link it to any other published data. Uh, if you're interested, look up the linked open data cloud. It's a really a fascinating, uh, you can see how They've merged on the internet all kinds of diverse data. So we talk about the primarily the RDF, RDFS, and OWL. Those are the standards that let you define uh, uh, ontologies and uh, are just resource, describe resources. So this is a, a little closer look. You know, what exactly do you store in an RDF? Uh, or an ontology or an RDF database. And that's what's what uh, you describe everything in terms of what's called the RDF triple. So triples are basically a subject, predicate, object uh, statement, if you will. Uh, it, it is a graph model if you look at it. So semantic web databases like to call themselves graph databases. It's because they want to ju jump on that bandwagon, but it's more a marketing, I think, than uh, an actual... Uh, comparison to property graphs. But uh, uh, so the triple is the way you make any statement about your your data. And notice that this is a, a, a bit of a linguistic structure, a subject, I could say subject verb object, and a linguist would understand that's a, a grammatical construct for uh, a, a complete sentence. So each triple is an assertion of a fact, and uh, it's a relationship that exists between these subjects and objects. But fundamentally, the semantic web, what you're, what you're really doing is you're describing things using a form of logic. And that's the essential to kind of grasp the how uh, ontologies or the semantic web is different than, than uh, relational databases. Here's a, another, ex just a quick example of diagrammatically how you would illustrate some data. And uh, this is my contact information. So in the center, we have uh, 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 a contact called John Singer ID. And notice if you go to the upper left, uh, there's a, a relationship called type, and it's a type person. So here we are defining a thing called John Singer and we're saying it's a type person. And then if you go around kind of clockwise, you can see more properties of this contact. Uh, I have a home page and there's the value. So, uh, and this is all drawn from a, you, you can design these vocabularies and give them names. This happens to be foe for friend of a friend. And the, the, Things to notice here is that, uh, like in a uh, ORM model, every property is described as its own entity, and and it's de defined by its the relationship it has uh, with the other entity. So, uh, so so properties are are definitely modeled, you know, as first class citizens. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is that the 
data model, if you will, the semantics are defined using the same language as the instance data. So you see this mixed here and where I'm defining um, my contact as a type, which is person. So that's really more defining the meaning, classifying what I am. And then the rest of it is actually calling out instances, specific instances of data. And it's all done using the same language. So you don't lose the semantics. When you store this in a database, you've got the instance data and the data model. It's all defined in the same place. And the database has, uh, has knowledge of, of, of this. It can make use of it. So once again, uh, understanding the semantic web. Uh, so the first thing that you need to do, once again, is you just need to let go of what you know about uh, relational databases. And uh, you realize we're modeling properties, domains, and ranges. These are first-class citizens. We're defining uh, the types in the model using the same language. Uh, what One of the things that's interesting is that you can define instance data without declaring a type. It just assumes it's a thing. And then you can come back later and the database can actually compute for you. It can analyze and figure out what the type is uh, from the instance data. <clears throat> and so this is kind of a, a backwards process from, if you think of it from the relational world, uh, in a relational database, I. I have to declare a type if I'm going to have a, which is the tables, right? So I, I have to declare I have a customer table before I can add data to it. Uh, in this uh, type of world, you can actually collect instance data and then ask the database to classify it for you or determine what category it belongs in. Uh, with the respect to the physical and conceptual model. So the physical data model is kind of fixed. It's the triple. Uh, that's how you express everything. And then the, but the conceptual data model is rigorously defined as opposed to the, the property graph where we're just kind of by convention defining the conceptual model. Here it's specifically called out. And uh, you don't use a type name without first saying that you have a type. And the same thing goes with the relationship or a property name or any of those things. So <clears throat> once again, when you go to persist data, you don't lose the semantics. Now, uh, like I said earlier, when you're defining your, uh, a semantic web database using RDF, RDFS, and OWL, you're really building an ontology and it's based on logic. It's uh, based on a form of logic. And uh, that's what you need to, you need to think of what you're defining in that terms, the, in the terms of, well, making this description of something, what can I infer from it using the logic? So, so logic is, to me, it's both its superpower and its kryptonite. And uh, the superpower is you get an inferencing engine and you can infer new facts from given facts. You can infer the types. You can classify things. All of this can be done by, uh, by the inferencing engine. The kryptonite part is it's hard to understand. Okay, it's uh, 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 difficult. Uh, you, you know, really smart people get logic and the rest of us all kind of struggle. So uh, so once again, uh, semantic web database and ontology as a technology, it, it supports, it seems to have some of the requirements that we're interested in. Uh, most importantly, the model equals data requirement is, is clearly here. The real issue is ease of use. You know, how can we make this stuff easier to use and accessible uh, to people and really our, our business users, not just IT experts. All right, so we're going to switch gears again now and let's look at another uh, technology, if you will. And I want to talk about linguistics or language. And I've, I've mentioned this uh, several times as we've been going along. Uh, I, I believe this is kind of an important next step. So 
Uh, so let's, <clears throat> excuse me, let's just take a quick look at uh, a couple things in this area. So, the, so linguistics, the study of language and grammar, uh, it's obviously a big field of study. And uh, at some point, a, a branch of that kind of came about, which was referred to as formal semantics. And they define this model of how language uh, and conceptualization works. And so uh, they talk about uh, you have sentences, which is, of course, a grammatically well-formed string of words. Uh, but the meaning, the question is, what's the meaning of the sentence? And the meaning that's carried in that sentence is called a proposition. And then uh, the thinking is that we convert the propositions into a formal semantics, which is this kind of this logic meta language. And so these propositions are then defined or kind of rewritten using this uh, predicate calculus, which is a form of logic. And uh, the, the procedure is over on the right. So you have spoken language. So somebody makes a statement, a sentence, and uh, uh, which contains a proposition. And this goes through a translation uh, into this logic meta language, which is, uh, which is, based on the logic from the language. And then uh, you go through this process of matching where you compare this proposition to your understanding of the world, your model of the world, and uh, uh, you determine whether the statement's true or not. And of course, this can all be accomplished uh, because we've converted it to logic and we can, we can process that. So here we have a way to, and this has been fairly well worked out, but how we can structure language and use it to compute, if you will. Uh, I don't know that this has been productized. It's If it has, I I'm, I'm, would be interested in hearing that. But, uh, uh, but the problem is, I guess not the problem, the question though is, is this really how our mind works? And this is kind of the brain as a computer model, if you will. But uh, but it the, but it is an example of a, a, a grammatical uh, system that's been worked out uh, that is computable. So uh, another uh, kind of moving ahead into what's kind of a more modern, if you will, view of the world is uh, uh, conceptual linguistics. And this is a, it's a branch, once again, it's another branch of the general linguistics uh, enterprise. But uh, uh, where this came from was the, uh, the psychology world uh, was studying, of course, psychology, the study of behavior and uh, cognitive psychology, where we started really thinking about how does our mind work? Uh, and then uh, uh, how do we build concepts in our mind and, and uh, how, how does all that work? Uh, or how does our consciousness work? And that field of study uh, kind of merged with linguistics. There was uh, some people who had the insight that, you know, our use of language is really based on our ability to conceptualize, which is this the, our cognitive process. And so these fields merged into this field called conceptual linguistics. And this is a very modern, uh, this is kind of the state of the state, if you will. Um, and, and this is a very simplified way of looking at the, the model that's, that's uh, come about from all this research in the we look over on the, the left-hand side, the, the thing that what conceptual uh, linguistics, how they see the world differently than the more formal linguistics approach, but they start with <clears throat> our, everything that we do in terms of our way of thinking and talking is based on our embodied experience. And so what they mean by that is everything that you sense, you build your conceptual structures based on how you sense the real world. And that kind of becomes your baseline. Uh, 
at, at which point then you build more abstract concepts. Obviously, as we deal with a lot of things that are abstract and not just what we experience in the world. But you build those abstract concepts basically as metaphors of the, the physical world that you've experienced. And so that's how you're able to build up this, this large conceptual structure in your mind. Uh, and that is all below in the subconscious. Now, the way language works is you, once again, before I talk, I build up in my mind this simulation or this mental space, and I pull the meaning out of my conceptual structure, which is has it's encyclopedic. It has everything I know, well, as little as that is. And I pull out what I need into this mental space, and uh, that's just what I need to in order to produce language. So I know I have an idea of what I want to talk to you about, and I pull that into this simulation, and because uh, I don't need to be thinking about everything I know, just what it is I want to talk about. And then from that simulation, I'm then a, I'm, I am then able to construct uh, a grammatical statement that you can understand. And, really uh, cool that you know they've got about seven minutes before the Q and A. Okay, so um, so then the person listening to me, they kind of do the process in reverse, and so they hear the words. Well, the words are prompts for meaning, and so the word doesn't carry all the meaning. It's just enough of a prompt that you can reach down into your your storehouse of concepts and knowledge, and you can build this simulation. This, it's kind of the video game that's constantly running in your head. And uh, and then that's how you understand, you know, what you hear the other person saying. So the, you know, uh, and the, the point behind this is, if you think about this, it's like a miracle. It's something we do this without even thinking. Uh, we're able to build these complex meanings and speak them to other people and the other people actually understand. So to me, this is the ultimate in ease of use. So that's, and this is why I think language is important. Uh, we, we, we need to move somehow, we need to move to where the way we model the data concepts is in a form that we easily understand and that and that survives being persisted to a database. And the only way I'm able to see how this can happen is we have to go to a more of a language-based API. And uh, this is how we can close the gap uh, between the meaning of things and the persisted data. So, you know, just, just imagine if the system was actually able to explain itself, right? So all those data quality, dictionary, stewardship processes, if we implemented them up front when we designed the data, then this, as it's persisted and captured in this uh, conceptual database, the system ought to be able to come back and explain to us, well, what is the definition of that? You know, who, which part of the business cares about it? We should be able to capture and maintain all this business context in a way that, uh, that stays with the data. Now the challenge as I see it is uh, though, is somehow we've got a bridge from the logic to the language. So that first linguistic model I talked about was a formal approach. The second one was kind of really, I think the more realistic, the human brain as a fuzzy logic pattern matching machine. And uh, somehow we've got to, imitate that because that's how we work, but it has to be computable, something that we can put in a computer. So we, uh, so once again, we started with these three high level requirements, model equals data, uh, technology neutral, which I'm kind of contradicting myself in a way. Be, uh, at some point, I think this language API has to persist data. Well, that's committing to a technology, but it still needs to be technology neutral enough that we need to be able to uh, interface it. You know, the existing legacy world isn't going to go away. And the tools, we, there's always specialized tools for processing data, and we need to push data 
out in a pipeline of those tools. Uh, and we need to read raw data in as our kind of the computer sense system. So, uh, but we need to do this in a way <clears throat> that more mirrors our human behavior. And once again, I believe that, that language is the way to accomplish that. Uh, we looked at some existing technologies, uh, <clears throat> some conceptual modeling methods. They're more conceptual than what we use today, and they didn't get picked up or used, frankly, uh, because they didn't persist. And we looked at some newer persistence mechanisms that seem to be a little more oriented uh, towards a conceptual models in the graph case and semantic. It's it's kind of what it is. It's it is a, a model of of <clears throat> understanding. So um, so there seems to be progress there. Um, and we looked at some language processes. There's a number of theories uh, of organ of grammar construction that show how we map the words to the meaning. And uh, we just need to tie that back to some of these persistence approaches. Uh, there's there's other technologies too, just, you know, lack of time here, but uh, there's a lot of work being done, obviously, in natural language processing. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying we need to solve that problem. Uh, natural language itself is 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 kind of hard to nail down, but I do think we need to system systematize it somehow uh, using uh, standard grammar constructions. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of work that's been done in various knowledge representation systems that are um, kind of more conceptual oriented. Uh, knowledge graphs is an example. You've heard that at the conference. That's a great place to start. Uh, so to me, the uh, the good news is that a lot of what we need exists. It's it's there. It just needs to get merged together in in, in a way that kind of unites uh, uh, the the language. The more human oriented way we process knowledge is through language, right? And that's easy because we don't even, we do it without even thinking about it. And somehow we need to merge that with a with a database technology that lets us capture and and move that in and out of a system. So uh, I believe this is going to happen. It's uh, uh, these there's an arc, if you will, to these technologies, and there's a great deal of research. And we already heard a lot of intersectionality between this, the technologies we looked at, in that they're, some of them are language oriented, and uh, some of them are more oriented to our actual way of thinking of concepts. So this is going to happen. All we need is a spark, and I think we're going to get this fire started. So, uh, uh, so this is very much a future. Uh, like I say, there are there's research and productization going in these different areas, but nobody's really pulled it together. And I'm suggesting that uh, this is what's going to happen in maybe five to 10 years is what we're talking about. And I think with that, I'm, I've hit my time limit. Uh, if you're interested, if, if, if these are new concepts for you, there's a couple of things you can do to get started. Uh, you can work on knowledge graphs. You can download uh, Nodera, which is a graph data modeling tool. It's free. And uh, you can work on building a knowledge graph. A lot of people in this conference have talked about knowledge graphs for those data-oriented processes. And I think that's a great idea. Uh, if uh, you'd like to learn, I, I also recommend dip your toe into the ontology logic world, and you can do that for free. Just download Protege. Uh, they have, there's a thing called the Pizza Tutorial, and that'll give you a uh, kind of a general intro, gentle introduction. So uh, I think I'm out of time, and. Uh, uh um, it was great, John. Uh, thanks for that. Um, I do have a couple questions in the uh, side chat that I pasted to you. Uh, if you want to weigh in on those. Okay. Yeah, I'm uh, switching over to that. 
Okay, so how the first one, I think I just kind of itched. How do you see the semantic data model adoption within the enterprise outlet for the next five years? So um, the, the next five years, I think you're going to see knowledge graphs uh, growing. Uh, there's uh, people are starting to build front ends that make it easy to kind of zero code or low code front ends. And uh, knowledge graphs, it's that they, you know, they use a, a, a simple semantic uh, linguistic structure. Um, and that's, that is probably the first thing you'll see more and more of, uh, uh, but, uh, how, who starts building a language, uh, front end and by language, I mean something where I can type in sentences and, or I can type in questions and get answers back. It, it, I, I do believe that we really need to get to that level of ease of use. Um. And I think that's that's in the research world. I think it's in universities, but but uh, it's five years before I think we see that kind of commercialized. There is a people have done a lot of amazing things with with language um, uh, uh, acquisition, you know, scanning text and extracting meaning. Uh, okay, next, property graph and semantic web graph database and the linguistic models all depend on clear meaning and definitions. Of and really, unless these are well-defined, the specific meaning tech doesn't matter. The specific modeling technique doesn't matter. Does it? Uh, so I, I, I guess what I'm saying is we need a specific modeling technique. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. It, it, as long as it's all in your head, it doesn't matter because those meanings don't get into the database. Now, um, uh, with the semantic web is to give it credit though, where do that there is a rigorous definition of the meaning of the terms that, that you're defining. So um, uh, not sure if I may, so not sure if I totally answered that question, but, uh, but yes, what what I'm looking for is a way a, a I believe a, we will use a structured language to both describe the model and the data in the terms that we in, kind of intuitively understand. Uh, please suggest a good primer book training material to take this forward. I did suggest a couple of things on this last chart here uh, to to take it forward, and uh, I, I, I'll tell you what there's. Uh, uh, and I'll, I'll try to get more of that on my website too. Okay, uh, page six. Doesn't every model lose some semantic information about the real world? Okay, well, the, yeah, fair enough. Um, the right, the, the real world, uh, our own minds, we do not retain all of our experiences that we've had in the real world. So uh, that's true that actually the, the way your mind works is uh, you create, you, you have your sensory experience, but then you create an attenuated version of it. So think of taking a JPEG file, of, you know, a 12 meg picture from your phone, and then you compress it into a JPEG that's small enough to send in an email. That's the attenuated version. So, uh, so absolutely, the, we're not necessarily trying to simulate the entire real world, but uh, but we are trying to get a better semantic understanding of what we do want to retain. Yeah, this. So, I, and this is where I wish I had I was actually in the room with the audience because this is a philosophical question, right? Uh, Philosophers have been studying, you know, truth, meaning, and what and existence for two thousand years. All right, so here we have another. Now, I would disagree that natural language is easy. We're only we're only very experienced using it. It quickly becomes apparent when we start trying to master a foreign language. Uh, I, I guess that's. Uh, the natural language that you speak is the easy, the language you speak is easy to do, 
but I, I don't disagree. You try to learn a foreign language and that becomes a real challenge uh, because we, we acquire language at birth, you know, but uh, uh, not at birth, I'm sorry, but we, we, we start to acquire language after, uh, you know, basically a year of age. Um, so uh, I think that's it on the questions. And I think we're pretty close to out of time. The, the slides, I apologize. I uploaded them today. If they're not here, they'll be on the website soon. Uh, so, uh, uh, or you can, they'll be on my, my website. They'll be on the Dataversity website, uh, hopefully soon. And, uh, so, uh, um, John, they actually, the slides did end up getting posted to the uh, session about midway through. Um, so I think people were able to get that. Um, okay, good. And uh, um, I did have a couple other comments come in here. Um, I'm going to send you a question right now. Uh, the, the traversal from conceptual to physical is one of de-abstraction. How would a semantic approach more effectively allow for this de-abstraction process? So I'm, I, uh, I, I'm not, I'm not sure I agree with that, or I, or I guess uh, I'm not sure I want that to happen. I think the, uh, uh, I, I want to be able to model concepts and understand the the. The concepts in our mind, this is one of the, the things that, that comes out of cognitive linguistics, is that the concepts concepts we have in our mind are actually built out of layers. And uh, uh, that's and the layers based on metaphors, if you will. So when we create an abstract concept, it's we actually build it from uh, the concepts of how we interact with the real world. And, uh, uh, and I'm I I'm not sure. I agree with the statement that it's a de-abstraction. I think uh, uh, the physical database is just becomes more technical. But uh, I, what my goal or what my hope is to see something where the the abstraction or the, the concepts are identified, and if if we have a layer of more abstract or more specific versions of the uh, of the concepts that 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 gets modeled effectively and we really I don't think we should really even be aware of the, the physical persistence of it 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 really that should just happen without us uh, uh, even uh, understanding or, or feeling it cool so that puts us at time uh, thank you so much John for this great presentation and thanks to our attendees for tuning in please be sure to complete your conference session survey at the bottom of this page. Uh, the next session uh, should start in about 10 minutes. Uh, thanks everyone. Okay, and thank you. <laughs>